I want to welcome you in Jesus' name to Grace Free Lutheran Church. Glad that you are with us today. If you are watching online, special welcome to you. Pray the Lord will encourage you and strengthen you as you worship with us today. Just one announcement I want to highlight for those of you who are here today. Valentine's Banquet, Sunday, February the 20th at 6 o'clock. Our youth will be serving us, and this is one of the ways that we can encourage them, bless them. A free will offering to uh, the camps that they will be taking part in. Call to worship today is taken from Psalm 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul will make its boast in the Lord. The humble will hear it and rejoice. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day that you've given, that we can come and worship you and praise you. Lord, I pray that we would together magnify your name, that you would be exalted in this place. Lord, you are worthy of our praise. You have given us life, and you have given us in Jesus eternal life. And so we praise you, we thank you, we bless your name. May you receive all the glory and the praise. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. Good morning. How many of you, if I stopped you on the street, could recite John 3.16 for me? <clears throat> Probably most of us. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believeth in him would not perish but have eternal life. That is the main line of a brand new song that we're going to sing this morning. So I invite you to stand as we begin to worship. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and sinners, come find his mercy, come to the table, he will satisfy, taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for, for God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only son to save us. Bring 
cross is waiting. God so loved the world. Isn't that good news? God so loved the world. Even though we are wretched sinners, he came and died for us. With that in mind, I invite us together to confess our sins. You can find that in uh, Psalm 51, 7 through 9. It'll be up on your screen this morning. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. God promises that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned unclean Singing how marvelous, how wonderful, and my song shall ever be. How marvelous, how wonderful is my sin. the gravity of our sin, but how wonderful and marvelous our Savior's love for us is that we would find nothing else but to kneel humbly before the throne of the cross and confess our sins, which we have done. It's because of that that we can joyfully 
confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from where he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In Psalm 103, verses 1 through 14, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget none of his benefits, who pardons all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Just as the Father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. Let's continue to worship. Oh, my soul, I will. 
suffering and you invite us with open arms and you take our sin and make us white as snow and it's because of that that we can proclaim bless the Lord oh my soul all that is within me bless your holy name in your name I pray amen you may be seated I'm going to invite the ushers forward as we worship the Lord with our tithes and offerings we have a blessing of having the mixed quartet from our Free Lutheran Bible College in Plymouth this morning to share with us uh, music. I invite you to take this time not to just listen, but also prepare your hearts for the hearing of God's word this morning.
stricken, abandoned and alone. He bore the world's affliction, he bore it as his own. For me he was forsaken, for me he died alone, my sin forever taken, that I might be his own, my sin Thank you, uh, Mixed Quartet. I don't want to say Mixed Up Quartet, Mixed Quartet. Appreciate your ministry among us, and we are so thankful for our Bible college, our seminary, and we're just uh, down the road from it. So We have the privilege to have people like you, young people, come and share with us today. We finish today our journey through the book of Jonah, a prophet on the run, Chapter 1, Jonah is running from God. Chapter 2, he's running to God. Chapter 3, he's running with God. 
And we kind of wish it would end on a positive note, but we come to chapter 4, and, and Jonah's running against God, uh, not real happy that the people of Nineveh had repented. So we turn to Jonah, chapter 4, we read verses 1 through 11. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you have a good reason to be angry? And Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when when dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. And when the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. And God said to Jonah, Do you have a good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. And the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work, and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? Let's bow in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for the lessons that we have learned as we've studied this book. Lord, you are an awesome God. You are a compassionate God, and you love all the peoples of the world. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would give us that love, that compassion for those who don't know you. I pray that our desire would be that they would come to a living relationship with you. Father, would you take now the words that you've given by the inspiration of your Spirit, apply them to our lives today. In Jesus' name we ask, amen. If you didn't know the end of the story of the book of Jonah, how would you have expected Jonah to respond when his ministry in the city of Nineveh, was so successful. Since he was willing to go to Nineveh, you might have expected or at least hoped that Jonah would have been joyful. After all, Jonah had the privilege of being used by God in a miraculous, amazing way. There are very few people, maybe no one, who's ever seen the kind of results to his preaching that Jonah did. Wouldn't it be wonderful if the same happened today where we share the word of God and an entire city comes to Jesus? What was Jonah's response? It was not joy. He was angry. In in our text, verse 1, it said, but it greatly displeased Jonah and he became angry. Matthew Henry says, what a strange sort of man was Jonah to dread the success of his ministry. Think about that. Dreading the success of his ministry, hoping that when he preached to the people of Nineveh, they would not repent and that God would judge them. That would be similar to Vikings fans being angry at the miracle of them winning the Super Bowl. Can't you imagine Grant Jones just throwing bricks at the TV if the Vikings won the Super Bowl? That would not make sense, would it? And here is Jonah. He goes and shares the word, 
They come to Jesus, and he is spitting mad. He is angry. Why was Jonah so angry? I'd suggest to you there are four reasons. First of all, Jonah had little commitment to God's plan. Jonah knew what God wanted for the people of Nineveh because he knew what God was like. Look at verse 2. He prayed to the Lord and said, Please, Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That's why he forestalled then and fled to Tarshish. He said, For I knew, I knew that you are gracious and compassionate. You are slow to anger. You are abundant in loving kindness and one who relents concerning, concerning calamity. I knew this would happen. If I obeyed and went to Nineveh, you'd have mercy on them. And that is something he did not want to happen. Jonah knew what God was like because he knew God's word. We saw that in chapter 2. Remember when he's in the belly of the fish and he's praying? There's one author who said that Jonah makes reference or quotes from nine different psalms. So he knew the word of God. And I would guess that he knew the scripture that was read this morning from Psalm 103. Because the psalms were part of worship at the temple. And if you look at verse 2 of our text and you compare that with Psalm 103, verse 8, it is almost word for word. Here's what Psalm 103, verse 8 says. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loving kindness. That's almost exactly what Jonah said in verse 2 of our text. Jonah might have even sung those words because... The psalms were often sung in the temple. So he knew what God was like because he knew his word. Very clear. But think of it, Jonah also knew that God was gracious and compassionate because he had experienced that in his own life. In spite of his rebelliousness, right? Running from God, heading to Tarshish, thrown overboard, and yet God had mercy on him. God sent that fish. That fish swallowed him. That saved his life. And so he had just experienced that a few days before going to Nineveh. You'd think he would have remembered that. You'd think he would have thought that God has been so gracious and compassionate to me. Oh, that he would be gracious and compassionate to others. How about the people of Nineveh? John Phillips says this truth about God, which should set joy bells ringing in every human heart, actually filled Jonah with rage. Another author says that God was too big-hearted for Jonah. God's word is very clear, isn't it? What is his desire for the Ninevites? What's his desire for the peoples of the world? 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. 1 Timothy chapter 2, 4 says, God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And if that is what God desires, should that not also be what we desire? Right? That all men be saved, that they would come to the knowledge of the truth. Not picking and choosing the ones that we would like to be saved, but having the heart of God who longs that all would come to Jesus. Are you committed to God's plan? Are you willing to make a difference in Nineveh, the place where God sends you? I trust you are. And when you share the word and people come to Jesus, I hope there's joy in your heart, not thinking, oh, no, God actually brought people to Jesus through my preaching, my testifying. That was Jonah. Little, little commitment to 
to God's plan. Well, secondly, Jonah had little compassion for Nineveh's people. Why did he not care about the people of Nineveh? Well, Jonah had been influenced by the common belief among the people of Israel that God was their God. God was their God. And the only way for God to deal with their enemies, which the Ninevites were, was to destroy them. After all, they deserved it. All the evil they had done to all the nations of the world, they deserved God's judgment. But guess what? Jonah wasn't the only one with an attitude like that. I started thinking about that. This attitude is not peculiar to Jonah in Scripture. Let me give you some other examples. James and John, the apostles of Jesus. Luke chapter 9 says, When the days were approaching for his ascension, he was on his way to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him, and they entered a village of the Samaritans. Oh, we know a little bit about the Samaritans and the Jews, right? And so they did not receive Jesus because he was traveling toward Jerusalem. And so James and John, they had the solution. Remember what it was? They said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? That sounds like a great solution, right? They're not going to receive you, so let's just wipe them out. We'll just send fire from heaven. And Jesus turned and rebuked them. And he said, you don't know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. Those were Jesus' disciples. It's a good thing their lives were changed over time because they didn't really have a heart for the Samaritans. Or how about the older son in the prodigal of the or the prodigal, the parable of the two sons. Remember the under son? He went and wasted everything, and, and he comes back home, and the father throws a party for him, and the older son comes in from the field and says, what's going on here? And one of the servants says, your brother's come. And your father has killed the fattened calf. We need to rejoice. What was the older son's response? He is angry. He would not go in and celebrate that his brother had come home. Or you think of the Pharisees who brought this woman to Jesus who was caught in adultery. They said, the law of Moses said she should be stoned. What do you say? What did Jesus say? The one here who is without sin, then you cast the first stone. They were hoping Jesus said, yeah, she ought to be stoned. Or how about the Pharisees who condemned Jesus for eating with the publicans and the sinners? Jesus said, it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. Then he said, go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. So Jonah's not the only one. There are many examples in Scripture of people who had that same kind of attitude that there are only certain ones that they wanted God to save. Not those Ninevites, not those tax collectors, not those sinners, not those Samaritans. Are we ever like Jonah? Certain people that we would rather have God judge than save? We need to check our own heart, don't we? Samuel Colgate was a member of a church many years ago. And they were praying that God would would use them to bring people to Jesus. And so there was this woman who was saved as a result of their ministry, and she wanted to join the church. And she wasn't quite the type that they wanted to have a part of their church. And so when the motion came to receive her as a member, there was no second. And then finally, we better table this. We better pray about this. 
And it was Samuel Colgate who stood up and said, we probably should have told the Lord when we asked that he would save sinners, what kind of sinners we wanted. What kind we wanted. What kind did Jonah want? Well, just his people, not the Ninevites. What kind did the disciples want? Huh? Well, not the Samaritans. Little compassion for Nineveh's people. That's what we see in the life of Jonah. Thirdly, Jonah had little control of his own passions. You know, there's some people who are hard to read. You can't tell if they're happy or sad because they just don't show a whole lot of emotion. Know anybody like that? They're just the same all the time, every day, no matter what's going on. And then there are others like Jonah. He is not hard to read, is he? You know exactly how Jonah felt, and we see it so clearly in our text. Jonah was so angry that God spared the Ninevites, he wanted to die. Verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life, for death is better to me than life. Now that's a little change in his prayer life, right? Right? What was he praying in chapter 2? In a nutshell, he's saying, Lord, save my life. Lord, I'm drowning. I'm in deep trouble. And salvation is is of the Lord. I'm in a hopeless situation. Now, after the Ninevites repented, it's just the opposite. Lord, not save my life, but Lord, let me die. Through his preaching, Nineveh was spared from judgment and Jonah couldn't handle it. He just couldn't handle it. How, what was he going to say when he comes back to Israel? And he has to tell them what happened. I went to Nineveh. I proclaimed the word of God and they repented. How would that go over with his fellow countrymen who had the same attitude that he did? They're our enemies. He said, I'd rather die than have to go back to Israel and tell them what happened through my preaching. So in response to Jonah's request to die, the Lord has a question for him. In verse 4, the Lord said, do you have good reason to be angry? You really feel that you have a reason to be angry, Jonah? I believe God asked him this question because Jonah should not have been angry. And that is why Jonah had no answer to God's question. It was met with silence. He didn't say a word. And so he just walks away because the question was too uncomfortable. And so verse 5 says, Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. What do you think he was hoping for? Sitting there outside the city, just watching, seeing what would happen in the city. I think it's pretty obvious. He was hoping that this gracious and compassionate God would Destroy the city. Wipe them out. The New American Commentary says, rather than examining himself as the Lord had wished, he examined the city. Without using any words, his very attitude was a defiant reply. We shall see whether my anger is justified or not. Perhaps Jonah hoped for destruction similar to to that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, I'm just going to watch. Maybe, just maybe, God will do it to Nineveh, what he did to Sodom and Gomorrah, and that would be awesome. Really. Isn't it amazing what anger can do? How destructive anger can be. Warren Wiersbe says, a simple test of character is to ask what 
makes me angry. Think of that. Last time you were angry, why were you angry? Was it righteous indignation or was it sinful? Huh? What makes you angry? Jonah was angry that God showed mercy. Wow. A prophet of God upset about that. Notice finally that Jonah had little desire for God's instruction. If you look at how God dealt with his angry prophet, you see how God was committed to teach him. Jonah needed to learn something, didn't he? He needed to learn that the salvation of souls is much more important than personal comfort. God was very gracious to Jonah. He provided comfort for him outside of the city. And guess what? Jonah loved it. He loved it. Look at verse 6. So the Lord God appointed a plant, and it grew up over Jonah, to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And the end of verse 6 says, And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. (laughs) That's the first time in this book we see him happy. Isn't that interesting? He was not expressing happiness or joy that he was delivered from the fish or that he was spared from the storm. He's happy about a plant. A plant that was giving him comfort. Oh, how nice, huh? Here's what one author says. The last clause in this verse is both fascinating and tragic. Literally, the text says that Jonah rejoiced over the vine with a great rejoicing. He wasn't just happy, this author says, he was deliriously happy. The miraculous growth of this vine caused Jonah to experience an emotion that is otherwise unrecorded in the book. He did not experience this emotion either in his own deliverance from certain death or from the mass turning of the people of Nineveh, his happiness was induced by a plant. (laughs) Extremely happy. So he's angry that God spared the people of Nineveh, but he was extremely happy about a little plant. What does that tell us about Jonah? How can you be angry that people have come to Jesus and you are so excited, so happy about this plant that God gives to you to give you comfort from the hot sun. At this point in his life, what can we say that Jonah was extremely self-focused? He is, he is like many people today who would say, all I want is to be happy. You heard that? That's all I want. All I want is to be happy. And so they pursue what they think will make them happy with little concern for others. And if they don't get their way, what? They're angry. All I want is to be happy. Well, God was about to teach Jonah that there's something more important than self-focused happiness. And he does it with a worm and a wind. If you've been with us through our study of Jonah, you know that God has used creation to teach him lessons, right? The wind that came and brought the storm and the fish, and now it's a worm and wind. Verse 7, but God appointed a worm When dawn came the next day, and it attacked the plant, and it withered. Oh, no! Jonah's uh, lovely plant. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint, and he begged with all his soul to die, saying, Death is better to me than life. Then God said to Jonah, now for the second time, 
do you have good reason to be angry this time about the plants? And he said, yeah, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Isn't that amazing? Jonah is so mad about the plant withering and the wind making him faint that he begged with all his soul to die. Homer Haley says, Man can become greatly concerned and disturbed when that, direct, when, when that which directly affects him is touched by the finger of providence. But he can be utterly indifferent, even hard, to that which may be of infinitely greater value when it doesn't affect him. Can you identify with Jonah at times? Isn't it interesting how we can be bothered by little inconveniences and not be concerned about people who are facing life and death without Jesus? I kind of wonder if we're more like Jonah sometimes than we want to admit. Things that bother us, sometimes just minor little things, yet there are people in this world who are living without hope. Are we concerned about them? We ought to be. When we come to the end of the book, there is a very sharp contrast between Jonah's concerns and God's concern. Look at verses 10 and 11. And the Lord said to Jonah, he said, you have had compassion on the plant. A plant that you didn't work for, you didn't cause it to grow, it came up overnight and it perished. Then God says, should I not have compassion on Nineveh? The great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who don't know the difference between their right and left hand as well as many animals? So so you're, you're concerned about a plant. What's God concerned about? The people in Nineveh need the gospel. It's interesting the word perished we find in verse 11, or verse 10, talks about the plant that came up overnight and perished overnight. That word is used two other times already in the book of Jonah. Chapter 1, verse 6, remember the captain of the ship said to Jonah, get up, call upon your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us and we will not perish. Chapter 3, verse 9, the king of Nineveh, remember what he said? Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. So the captain of the ship, what's he concerned about? People. The king of Nineveh, what's he concerned about? People. Jonah, what's he concerned about? plant. Why? Because it comforted him. It made him feel good. And so therefore, the most important thing in Jonah's mind here was my personal comfort. Interesting, isn't it? In contrast to Jonah's concern, the Lord's concern is the people of Nineveh. And what's interesting is that this book and the book of Nahum are the only two books in Scripture that end with a question. And the question isn't answered. It just ends with a question. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh? the great city in which there are more than 120 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals. What's the obvious answer to the question? Should God have compassion on the people of Nineveh? 
What's the answer? Yes. Thankfully, yes. So obvious, right? And the book ends there with that question. So who are the 120,000 that cannot know the difference between their right and left hand? Some suggest it's little children who haven't yet learned their left and right. And so God may be saying to Jonah, don't you think Jonah, don't you think I should have compassion on the children of Nineveh? Would you be happy if I destroyed them? That's quite a question, isn't it? So you don't, you don't care about these little children? Others see this as a description of the city of Nineveh, because they didn't have the truth of God's word. They were like spiritual children. They were spiritually ignorant. There were things about life that they didn't know because they had been steeped in idolatry and false teaching. I think of what Jesus said when he was on the cross. Father, Forgive them. Why? They know not what they do. Spiritually ignorant? The Apostle Paul, he describes his own life before he was saved. 1 Timothy 1.13, I was formerly a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent aggressor. Does that sound like Nineveh? Paul goes on to say, yet I was shown mercy because I acted what? Ignorantly in unbelief. Maybe that's why Paul says then in 2 Timothy chapter 2 of the compassion we are to have for people who are ignorant of truth. 2 Timothy 2 verse 24, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Paul is describing people who are spiritual captives, people that need to come to their senses, and so instead of wanting them to be judged, what does Paul say? Perhaps they'll be saved. They'll come to their senses. They'll receive the knowledge This is why God says, should I not have compassion on people like this? People who are spiritually lost and ignorant and don't understand. Should we just wipe them out? That's what God is saying to Jonah. So why is the question not answered? Jonah, did he, did he have an answer? Did he want to give an answer? Because huh? at that point, when God asked the question, should I not have compassion on Nineveh, what do you think Jonah would have said? If he's spitting mad that they repented, he'd probably say, huh. Or maybe it's left unanswered because it's a question that we need to answer ourselves. Jonah needed to answer this question because the compassion of God didn't just apply to the people of Nineveh. It applied to Jonah too because he too was a sinner, wasn't he? And the same is true with us. You and I need to answer that question as well because we are in as much in need of a Savior as the people of Nineveh were. God is not great on a curve. We're all sinful, lost, without the mercy and grace of God. Every one of us. 
the good news. We need to settle on some good news here. The good news is what? That God is gracious and compassionate. That God is willing to forgive because God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. And Jesus has taken the judgment that you and I deserve on the cross. And that's why salvation is offered to the whole world. Because Jesus paid that price. Gordon Jensen has written a song. Some of you have heard it. I was guilty with nothing to say. They were coming to take me away. Then a voice from heaven was heard that said, Let him go and take me instead. But I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But what? But Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you took our place. In your mercy and your grace, you reached down to us. You became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in you. That's the message that we rejoice in today, and that ought to be the message that we would want others to hear, that they too might rejoice in the mercy and the grace of God. Father, give us compassion for those who are lost. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand as we sing together our closing hymn? Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.